Hi, this is the Magnificent Midlife Podcast and I'm Rachel Lancaster. This is where we celebrate women in midlife and beyond. We challenge the status quo and bash those negative stereotypes about being an older woman. We're not over the hill at 40, 50, 60. We're just getting started. And the world needs us now more than ever. I'll be talking all things midlife, about issues that matter, and sharing fabulous stories of amazing women doing very cool stuff. Now is our time. My guest today is Sherry Sidoti, and she is an author and a yogi. She's the founder of Fly Yoga School on Martha's Vineyard, and she recently published her first book, a memoir about her own healing journey, A Smoke and a Song, A Daughter's Memoir of Living in the Layers. Welcome, Sherry. Thank you so much, Rachel. It's wonderful to be here. I'm very excited to talk to you. As I was telling you before I hit record, I finished your book this morning, and I was saying I always like to try and read um, guests' books if I possibly can. And I thought I was running out of time, but I was really captivated by your book. I wanted to read it. It wasn't, sometimes it can be a bit, oh, I need to get through this, you know. But I really wanted to read it. And congratulations, it's a beautiful book. It's It's a really thoughtful book and it makes the reader think. So thank you very much for your book. Congratulations. Thank you so much for your kind words about the book. It, um, yeah, it was, it's, it's been a beast of a journey, but a worthy one. And thank you for what you said, that it makes you think and feel, uh, you know, that's, I think that's all a memoirist could hope for, is that mm. something in their story, you know, something in my story speaks to the reader in a way that makes them think about their own. There were lots of instances of it, and I could see my life in your life. There were elements of it where I could say, oh, that really rings true, or that really strikes a chord with my personal experience, even though my personal experience is completely different. But there were elements of it that were just similar or just reminded me of things. So what inspired you to write your book? Um... I think that I didn't set out to write a book. So I I didn't have the thought beforehand of, you know, now is time to write my book. I do believe that I always had the desire internally since I were, since I was a kid to sit down and write, but I'd never really thought through that it would be a memoir of my own life. And um, at the time that I started to write, which was in in the middle of the pandemic during, you know, it was about September of 2020, I was really just giving myself permission to write. I was going through a huge transformation as we all were during the pandemic, a time where we really stop and take inventory of our life. I had just turned 50, become an empty nester, gotten re-engaged. My mother was diagnosed with terminal cancer. Um, I had just moved out of a home where I lived and raised my son for 18 years. So there was a lot going on personally. Um, And I had decided to take some time off from teaching yoga, particularly I was offering yoga teacher trainings and they could be really intense and to have to pivot and bring that to an online format was a blessing, but also very exhausting. And so I had decided to just take some time off from teaching and being the one to help others steward themselves through big life transformations and gift that back to myself. And I had always wanted to create, but never really gave myself time to make art and to be a creative being. I feel that I had considered my worth and purpose more on the path of service. And so I took some time off and I started to write. I was part of a weekly online writing group, a very informal. We didn't have a teacher. We were just giving each other prompts and writing and then meeting once a week to read our stories. And about six months in, I started to see with the help of my my Zoom mates that there was some connective tissue happening in my different stories that irregardless of the prompt, there kept, it kept circling back to my own personal healing journey, some thread about being part of a 
family of lots of very strong and fierce women. Something um, in there about transgenerational inheritance and the grandmother, mother, daughter thread and, and bond. So I, when I started to see that there were some connective, you know, connective pieces, some bridges between the various things I was writing, I thought, hmm, maybe this is my book. And I just kept going. And lo and behold, I ended up writing a memoir. <laughs> there was much more that I wrote that didn't make its way into this one. It just didn't fit. But um, yeah, so I think it was more of an organic process. It was an unfolding, almost as if the book wanted to be written, the timing was right, and I became the vessel for that. So have you not had any training or no sort of courses on how to write? No, I haven't. I've taken a couple, like, as I mentioned, I was part of this very informal writing group. I had taken a couple of one-off, you know, couple hour workshops. I did about eight years earlier, a memoir writing workshop with a local author here, Nancy Arany, who is just offers like a beautiful container for people to write their stories. So I had had some workshops and experiences writing, but not formally. So I studied anthropo yeah, I studied anthropology and then I became a yogi and studied Latin American studies. So my studies uh, were never in the creative writing field. But I was raised by co-raised by a gr grandfather poet. So I was around writers and writing and that for much of my life. And um, there's a lot of art and art artists in my family as well. So I think that the the creative urge has been there. I just didn't know what my medium was. But yes, no, or I should say no, I did not have any formal writing. So when I did decide to really pursue this project and, and write a memoir, I did a lot of self-study and a lot of um, learning on my own, listening to lots of podcasts, reading books, connecting with other writers, you know, really trying to create a tribe. And it was a, a relearning experience. I started the project at 50 years old. The book came out, I'm now 53. And it was a kind of like venturing into an entire new thing for me, writing the process, publishing completely new to me. So I really had to learn a lot in these past few years, which was very exciting to be able to do at this age. Well, I'd say really hats off to you because there's there's real craft to your writing. It's real, yeah, I would say the real craft. There's, it's The way you write is, is very evocative. And as I said also, you know, before I hit record, it's very, there's a lot in a little bit of space. You write very, I don't know what the word is, but it, there's no fluff. There's no extra stuff there, you know. And I, as I admitted to you, I was rushing to get through your book. So I would, you know, have got to the end of it by the time we spoke. And I got to the end of it and I knew I was rushing. And I didn't want to rush because I wanted to savour it. Mm. And yet I had to rush because I wanted to get to the end of it. And then I got to the end and I thought, oh, blimey, I think I've missed some stuff. So I had to go back and check things. but. Yeah, just, I mean, you, you are a writer. You know, you've written one book and you're a yoga lady, you know, from Martha's Vineyard, but you're a writer. Absolutely, you are a writer. So, yeah. Oh, that was brilliant. Thank you so much for saying that. I think that the experience that I've had prior to that, you know, being a yoga teacher and using words and verbal cues to kind of steer a space and a, an experience for people. That certainly helped um, in terms of what you were saying about there's a lot in few words. Um, when you teach yoga, you really have to use words sparingly and not over explain things because we're moving as we go. So that has certainly helped over the years, having you know 20 years behind me of teaching yoga. And even prior to that, um, in my 20s, I worked at the Getty Museum, and one of my jobs there was to offer or to write out verbal descriptions of the paintings for those who are partially sighted or blind. Oh. So I had to learn how to kind of see something visually, look at a painting, 
and then really um, deconstruct it with words so that it could be listened to by someone who doesn't have sight or is partially sighted and get the gist of the painting. So that certainly helped in terms of using language, I believe. Yeah, and, and yeah, yeah, I love language. Works. I mean, words are, it's so complex because it's so limiting. And yet at the same time, there's so much feeling that could be evoked and emoted through language and rhythm. So that's another piece too, is that while I was writing, I would write, and when it came time to go back and look at that piece and consider editing it, I would read it into my phone and then go for a walk in the woods and listen to it. And you can really hear where there's extra or where the rhythm doesn't flow or where you may need to change a word so that there's you know three words in a row that begin with the same letter or it's musical as well. And I think Mm. By my nature, I'm also a musical person. So I believe that found its way into my writing. I think that's a very good tip, actually. I mean, I did the audio book for my book and I had read it out loud before it went to be published. So exactly, yes, that. Mm -hmm. you Then you pick up where the where the stops are, where it doesn't flow, exactly that, where you've repeated a word. I mean, yes, I had an editor who'd done that as well, but it was really useful to read it out loud. Absolutely. Um, I'd say that's a, that's a really good tip yeah, and for you, any budding writers. You hear, I could also hear where I didn't sound like myself. I could hear where I was trying to be a writer or where I was, <laughs> where <laughs> yeah, I was trying yeah, to yeah. say too much or where I was being a little um, uh, hoarding with my you know vulnerability. I could hear my own truth and where it felt a little fabricated or something. And I would go, oh, that needs to be changed. And that really helped with my editing process, I think, listening to my myself read. Mm. Yeah. And how did you, I mean, writing a memoir is a really difficult thing to do because you run the risk of upsetting people, yes. don't you? How did you navigate that? Because most of your characters are still alive. Yes, yes. Um, it's very... It's an interesting journey. I think when I was writing, I was just giving myself the freedom to write and I wasn't thinking about who might read it. <laughs> I think that helped with the writing and helped with me expressing myself in a way that felt very raw. I think that um, I could have used, had I studied memoir writing more or had a mentor, I probably could have used a little assistance once I got to the editing part of it. I tried to align the stories from, you know, my own, um, I guess, like ethical or spiritual guidelines. So one of them that I tried to move with through the story was, if it's not my story and I don't have permission to share it, then it's not my story to tell. So when I am telling other people's stories, for example, there's a chapter where I really get into my mother's story. First off, she did give me permission to share that. But secondly, I decided that I did, it was my story as well. And my part of her story was when she told me her story. So instead of just writing, for example, that chapter about her, her background and her difficulty as a teen and in her early 20s, I chose to tell the story of when she told me about it, so how I learned it. And so thus it was my story to tell in yes. a way. So that was one guideline that I gave myself. Um, it becomes very difficult once you're really immersed in it because um, I spent so much time in an insular space really digging into my own experiences and then trying to make sure that there's a global view wasn't always possible. So I think um, in some areas of the story or with some of the characters, I certainly could have flushed them out fuller or flushed out the dynamic fuller so that you could see the joy alongside with the challenges, or you could see maybe the relationships that others had apart from me and not just my what I was seeing or experiencing, but to give a little bit more well-roundedness of the other characters' relationships with one another. 
apart from me, but at the same time, it's a memoir and it's my story. So, and it's not an autobiography and I'm not writing anyone else's story. So it was very challenging to know what to keep in and what to take out. I did have a lot of conversations during the writing process with those who are in the story. I did give people permission to change their name, which some of the characters' names have been changed and identifying details as well. Um, and then a lot of the process has been happening now that the book is out. Like the conversations that I've had with, for example, my sisters, my mother, my ex-husband, you know, some of the characters in the book, the book ended at a certain point, but our life has not, <laughs> not yet. And so our relationships continue. And in some ways, what's written in the book, even those that might have had some challenges with not feeling like their characters were really holistic and, and understanding why in the, my own process, but at the same time, just feeling a little, maybe a little tender about what's in there. Our conversations that have uh, continued since the book came out have been so beautiful and so profound and not always easy, but really wonderful. So I think in some ways, the challenge of what to write about other people and how to align with that is a jour ongoing journey after the book comes out as well. It has to be. And people are going to have their own experiences. And I've been doing my very best to honor how my book has made them feel about our relationship and do the work that is required to continue to allow our relationships to grow and evolve. And I think that we're all doing a really good job. I have to say I've been given a lot of grace by the people in my life who are in the book. Good. Mm -hmm. I'm glad to hear that because there's also quite a bit of trauma in the book, isn't yes. there? And, yeah. And one of the questions I wanted to ask you is, you know, how, how do you write about trauma without triggering trauma? Yeah. And, you know, triggering that not just for yourself, but as you say, for the people in the book. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. On a personal note, I used a lot of my yoga, meditation, and somatic healing practices that I've been um, integrating into my life and sharing with others for two decades. So that really came to play. I used my practice to go into the writing space and also to come out of it. Um, but even with all the um, movement and meditation and sometimes just walking in the woods or whatever it was that I needed to do to process the the memories that I was really going deep into because it was I I don't know if you noticed but I was writing from the present tense yes I was going to comment on that yeah, actually because okay. I really liked that that was in fact it was one of my earlier questions when we moved on yeah yes the present tense yeah Go so on. I wrote I wrote my story in the present tense which meant that in order to do that I had to comb out what I now know and what I've you know the the, mm. the knowledge or wisdom or experience that's gained mm. throughout the life our life as we as we move through these experiences and look back on them 20 30 40 years later so to go in and to write some of these very challenging experiences that, that I had, I would use the meditation practice to go in, which I think also assisted the writing, right? It, it allowed me to be in present tense, to be, drop myself back into that experience and write it with a lot of detail and remember it with a lot of detail. But then you have to take yourself out, right? So I did a lot of practices um, on the backside of writing that was, you know, silly practices that I do, chanting, shaking, moving my body, just doing things to try to reconnect back with the present moment. Um, also very important to have a circle, which I didn't, I, I, I brought my circle in a little too late, I would say in my journey, but for anyone who's going into a memoir writing experience, I highly recommend having a circle of support you know, maybe your therapist, your teachers, your mentors, you know, professionals in the field that can support you as you are returning to memories that could be, that were traumatic or challenging and difficult. Um, I think also I've done a lot of work, you know, healing, being on a healing journey for as long as I have, we all have been on a healing journey, whether we're aware of it or not, but I've consciously been on a healing journey and surrounded myself in the field of healing from trauma and from our, you know, survival mechanisms and coping strategies and all this that we develop since childhood. 
So it is also a language that I speak, not only verbally, but in my body. So I think that there's just, there was just like kind of this ongoing process of that. So that's the first part of your question. The second part of how do I not trigger others is something that I'm still contending with, and I don't know if I have the answer to that. I know I'm, one is, you know, with most of the challenging life experiences that I was writing about, particularly those from childhood, my sisters and I and my mother and I and all four of us have really spent a lot of time processing our life together, not so much because of the book, but more importantly, because it's the end of my mother's life. Um, and although she seems to be outliving us all, <laughs> she's still alive and going strong. But um, getting a terminal um, diagnosis or prognosis really also is another big marker in life where you start to take inventory. And I think in the process of trying to go through this together, my sisters and my mother and I have really spent a lot of time over the past three years processing some of our old stuff together. So I'm hoping that the book isn't re-triggering, but I, my guess is that it might be, not only for the people in it, but for the reader. And that was another thing to go, you know, do we put a, you know, how in movies now they're putting disclaimers at the beginning of the movie, do, should we be doing that for books? And then, you know, making sure that the back copy of the book or the book blurb at least gives some insight to what the reader is stepping into. Yeah, it's a great question, and I don't know if I have the answer to that. It's a work in progress. Mm -hmm. It is. I'm learning <laughs> as I go. It's it's very similar to, you know, when I'm, when I'm offering yoga a, a space for people to really unwind in, in the yoga setting or, say, for example, in, in a retreat or in an immersion or training, much of our stuff is going to come up. It may not be flushed out verbally. We may not have a conversation about it. It's not necessarily therapy, but hopefully I trust that the movement itself and the practice itself will bring us to the place that we need to go to with it. And I kind of had the same hope with the book. Like there might be moments that are uncomfortable for the reader. There may be times that kind of agitate us as a reader, but that if we keep going, somehow the process or the journey is flushed out so that we can come to our own other side with that part of the story. So I'm hoping that, you know, there was a similar process for the reader. Yeah. I mean, I, I found it profound. I, th I would really recommend that people go and read it. And I think it's for all daughters and guess what? We're all daughters. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. um, I mean, I don't have sisters. Um, I would love to have had sisters and I have a son, one son. And there was one line in the book. I have three stepchildren as well, but I have, I have one son of my own. And there was one line and I, I don't know whether I interpreted this correctly or not, but you, when he's born, you say, thank you for being a boy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And knowing what I know about your family history with your mother and your grandmother, was that that you wanted a boy rather than a girl? because of what had happened? I think, I'll be honest, I tried to go through my pregnancy because I didn't do any tests. I had a very natural pregnancy and a home birth, and I didn't do ultrasounds and find out the sex of the baby. But I had a very strong feeling the whole time that I was, I had a boy, mm. but I wasn't sure. So I, I think I didn't, I, I, I went through the pregnancy going, whether I have a boy or a girl, I'm getting, I'm, ha I'm having whatever I'm meant to have, right? And also, you know, I didn't think about it at the time, but now there's, you know, who knows if someone's going to choose to stay in, in the gender that they're born in. But I, um, I did feel a sense of relief when I did give birth and realized that he was a boy. And mm -hmm. yes, I think, I don't know if it was such a conscious feeling at the time where I was making the connection of the intergenerational or transgenerational trauma that I had inherited, but I just knew I was happy to have a boy. <laughs> you know, my whole life I was around girls. I mean, we had one male figure in our family who was my grandfather, who was amazing and tender and loving, and I'm so blessed to have had that as my main man, you know, in my life. Mm -hmm. But... Um, 
but there were so many women and we're strong and fierce and loud and <laughs> you know, it's a lot of energy. And um, yeah. it wasn't that I, I, I didn't appreciate the women in my life. I, they really buoyed me. I mean, I was around really strong women my entire life and their fierceness really steered me to become the person that I am. My mother, my grandmother, and my sisters, even the female cats, <laughs> but, but, um, shadow, yeah, shadow. shadow yeah. <laughs> but I, um, did you change shadow's name? No shadow is shadow. <laughs> yeah. Shadow passed away two weeks ago. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's been really intense. Oh. But, yeah. But it, I understand that yeah. I lost a girl cat last year yeah. and it was devastating. 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 She was with me for 20, almost 21 years. So she's been part of all the biggest, you know, moments. And she was a rescue. Yeah. So she was like my cat, a cat that wasn't really supposed to survive and then did survive. Yes, exactly. And, and very I feral and oh, just such a, such an incredible spirit. And yeah, so I'm grieving the loss of shadow, although she is so with me as mm -hmm. all of our loved ones who have passed are, at least that's how I feel. So at any rate, I did feel um, grateful or just relieved when Miles was born and I saw that he was a boy and just thought, okay, this is a way, I know I already know I want to kind of change that pattern in our family, but now it makes it that much easier because he kind of came in and marked himself differently. And uh, what's not mentioned in the book is that my nephew, who was born before my son, my nephew Justin, Lisa's boy, he was the first boy born in our family in 90 years. So there was, really? a, there was a 90 oh year span goodness. in the family of only girls wow. being born. Yeah. Yes. Wow. So Miles was number two on that, you know, in that lineage. So I really feel like Justin and, and Miles kind of came in to like mix things up and go, <laughs> okay, enough. <laughs> enough. Brilliant. Brilliant. How interesting. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. There's so much meat in it. I, I just personally, I, I thought. I thought I would do a better job with a boy. Mm. Mm -hmm. that, that I was I was frightened mm -hmm. of having a girl. Yeah. Not of having not of having a girl second. And in fact, part of my story is that I wasn't able to have a second child. Mm. And I dearly, dearly would have loved to have had a second child and had a girl. But I didn't want a girl first. Mm. I wanted to practice on a boy. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. There's something so special about the mother-son bond that I, you know, had really little idea of how profound it is. And there's, I think that there's an innate forgiveness that, I mean, I, this is obviously a generalization. I'm sure there are plenty of mother-son relationships that are very strained. But I think that um, particularly because I got divorced and we spent a lot of time where it was just the two of us for many, many years living alone, that he really kind of took on this. I think that he just has this innate forgiveness toward me and the mistakes that I've made, like a, a tender compassion. And it's also who he was born, how he was born. He is a very compassionate and tender and loving soul. He doesn't take a lot personally. And so he was able to see and go along with me and my faults and discoveries as I was having them and gave me a lot of courtesy in that process. So, yeah, I, I think if I had a girl, <laughs> at least thinking of my sisters and I, like we constantly had our say in what my mother was doing and why. And, you know, we picked, we picked <laughs> at her all the time. You know, we kind of can still probably consistently try to tell her how to live her life and what to do and point out her, you know, her mistakes and her shortcomings and stuff. And I feel like my son, Miles, has been very generous with me, <laughs> much more generous than I've been with my own mother. And you describe him as your greatest teacher as well, which I think For is sure. really rather lovely. Yeah. yeah. I feel that way. Yeah. How old way. is your son? He's 25. Oh, yeah. So a little bit older. So Miles is now 21. And that generation, you know, they all came in during 9-11 era. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, the, the kids that are his well, age. Well, he, my son and I, we were in Manhattan <gasps> when 9-11 happened. Wow. We were living in Midtown. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That's intense. And he was... What he was, he was 
21 years now, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, is it 21 years or 23 years? Yeah. Know, it's not It'll be 20 or 22 years. I think we just passed 22. But I went, I went to get him from daycare. He was in daycare. Wow. Um, in, at, uh, in the River School, oh. I remember, River School in Manhattan. And I went to pick him up. So intense. So intense. Yeah, and I had just found out I was pregnant. So this generation of kids, you know, they, they I think even at your son's age, to have that experience in the early years. And then for, for Miles's age specifically, they were all born into 9-11 and they graduated COVID class of 2020. Yeah. So they all graduated high school. You know, they lost their last semester of high school mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the world was in lockdown right at the time that they're about to leave and, you know, start their rite of passage into their mm -hmm. quote unquote adult life. And so mm -hmm. it's, 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 I feel like, you know, certain generations bring forth certain natures. And I do feel like that generation of kids, you know, they came in at a very challenging time and they started adulthood at another really big <laughs> poignant <laughs> time in life. Yeah. So yeah. there's something yeah. in them that mm -hmm. I guess is prepared for this or can handle it. Mm -hmm. And I remember my son saying that to me at some time, he was a lot younger. It was during, I, I don't remember exactly what was happening historically, you know, at that time, um, it might've been right around election time. And he said, don't worry, mom, we got this. We got this. And I believed him, like that this generation, you know, they were born with the tools to take on what they're faced with right now. Good, because they're faced with rather a lot, aren't I they? Know. Poor things. I know. Oh, yes. good. I'm glad, I'm glad there's some confidence there. That's good. Yeah. So changing, and I want, now I just want to go back to the present tense a bit, mm -hmm. um, because you've talked about using your practice to take you back into the mindset that enabled you to remember the details of that. So I would like you to patent that, please, and record your meditation and make it available because the level of detail that you were able to put across was, was incredible, actually, and was very evocative, evocative of the time, evocative of the place, um, and it was done in the present tense, which which really brought it to life. So, yes, please, can you... Can you record some podcast? I would, I would like your meditation so that I can go back in time and remember all the things that I've forgotten. I would be happy <laughs> to. And if you, if anyone, you or any of the listeners are interested, I, I use mostly a technique called five sense awareness. Oh, really? Yeah. Ah. So you know, we do a little okay, bit. Of, tell me about yeah, that. Yeah, we just we do a little <laughs> bit of grounding to bring us into the present moment. The other thing is, I just want to point out, I was waking up at about three in the morning, and that's when I would write. So it was already this kind of liminal space that I was in because I wasn't quite yet in my day. Everybody else in the home was asleep and I could, and I, and I wrote outdoors, I would sit on my porch and write. So I feel like by hand then were you writing? I was writing hand? on my iPad. I had a little keyboard connected to it. And so I okay. didn't even have to turn on any lights. So I would take my iPad and sit outside on my porch even in the winter, I bundled myself up and wore gloves. And, <laughs> and, um, and so I think that also the time of day and the place where I was writing really had an impact on what ended up coming through and my capacity to go deep in and remember because I wasn't boggled mentally with regular life stuff at that time of the day. There was nothing else interfering me, you know, from being in fully in the story. So that was helpful as well. But I would ground myself just, you know, simple, feel my, my butt on the chair or on the ground and connect with the sounds that I felt and go through um, in the yoga practice, what's called our five bodies. So you start with the physical, then you connect to your breathing, then you go into, you know, your emotional, mental state. What am I thinking about? How do I feel right now? Going into that place would often tell me what story I wanted to go back to. Then connect a little bit with like intuition. Is there anything that I can't hear or anything trying to find me that wants to come through in this story and just ask the question? I don't necessarily need to answer it. So I would start with that grounding. And then once I knew what story to kind of go in and write or that I wanted to return to, then I would just use my five senses. You know, what do I feel on my skin? 
Yeah, what, what environment am I in? What part of the room am I sitting in? What's happening in the physical space? What am I hearing? You know, is there music? Are there other voices? Is, are there crickets? That kind of thing. What do I smell? What do I see? <laughs> right? So, and what do I taste? So you go through the five senses. And so I would plot myself back into a place. An example, my grandmother's painting studio and plop back in. And I may not know exactly what story wanted to come through, but if I started to tune into the sensual experience of being there, almost always the story or the scene would come forward from that. It was a lot of trust. It was a lot of following, like getting so connected to myself and then following the lead of what came from that. Um, so there was a lot of practicing trust. Maybe it was helpful at the time that I didn't necessarily consider myself an author or a writer because I would just almost more see it as a practice, very similar to how I would take on a meditation or a yoga practice and just go, tell me what I'm here to know or to see or to remember and then follow that. And then once, you know, once it came to editing it, it was a whole different story. There was a different process, but, um, that's really the, the, that five sense awareness, you know, go in through my bodies, get as grounded as I could to the my present moment. And then from there, really feel what scene I'm supposed to go back into, or what location, then I'd plot myself into the location and use my five senses. And the story often came forward from that. And is that something you learned? Or did you just intuitively know that this was the way to do it? I think because I use those practices um, anyway, and have been for a couple of decades, they naturally found their way into the writing process. As I, as I think they also find their way into other processes, maybe not with as much um, intention, but they do find their way into a lot of my conversations or relationships or experience. If I'm just sitting at the beach, I'm not just seeing the ocean, but I'm tuning into all of the, sen- the, the full five sense experience that I'm having, for example. So I do think that it's, you know, uh, habits are formed by repetition and I've been doing a lot of these practices for many, many years. And so now it has become more habitual. So I think it's, it finds, it, it certainly found its way naturally into the writing. I recently taught a workshop at, um, at an event here where I live on Martha's Vineyard on meditation for writing, for inspired writing. And We just simply did the meditations where we went in through our grounding and through our body. And then we went into the five senses and I gave a prompt and people wrote. So it was really fun for me to have that experience with others. Maybe it's something I'll, I'll start to offer. Do it online. I'll, I'll come. Exactly. (laughs) That's what I'm thinking when you said, can you record it? I'm like, maybe it is something I'll start to offer. Cause I think it could be useful for any writer, not just a memoir writer. It would be amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Be amazing. Mm-hmm. I'd love it. And I'd love to learn how to do it. So I'd love that could be a re- I'd become a, I'd come along as a regular. Yeah. Well, I'll certainly be in touch with you when I do it. And if not, nothing else, I'll record something for you. I, oh, thank you. You're welcome. I sound, it just sound, I mean, and somebody like me, I just wouldn't think to do that. Wouldn't think to do that. But it's, I can see how powerful that would be. Yeah. It was certainly helpful to have all these years of, of yoga and meditation behind me. I, I, can't, I think that perhaps one of the reasons why I didn't write prior to now, at least, you know, intentionally as a, as a writer, I, I think because I really needed this behind me to, to write the book that wanted to be written. I think had I tried to write something before, it would have had, uh, it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have gone through all of those layers. I think it would have, it would have stayed a little bit more on at, you know, where my point of view was coming to the reader as a teacher. And that was another thing I really wanted to gift myself. I have been teaching for so many years that when I set, when I sat down to write, I was like, I'm taking off my teacher cloak. I am really just a learner here. And um, because writing was so new to me, I really wanted to gift myself a freedom to write as just a human being and not someone who was imparting lessons, trusting that that will happen on its own. And that was another personal choice of why I chose to put it in the present tense, because I decided that I would prefer the reader to have the experience along with me 
and make meaning related to their own life along with me. At some point, I had almost a whole book in past tense, you know, as me reflecting back, and I had to go back and rewrite it. And so to do that, I had to comb out all the things that I now know. And some of them made it to the end in that last, I'd say the last third of the book. And some of them never circled back, and that's okay. I thought it was brilliant because, so for example, you know, as I was reading it and, and digesting it and thinking about how you were able to write about your first marriage without the knowledge that it had ended. And I was thinking, how how could I do that? Because I, I once tried to write a story of something that had happened to me many moons ago and um, I've never published it. It sits in a drawer. But one of the criticisms, I did give it to a, a freelance editor and one of the criticisms of it was that I was writing it too much from the perspective of now, mm. with knowledge now rather than what I knew then. So it is yeah, really hard. And, you know, we hard. do our best. I'm not sure if I, you know, if I did it um, as well as I could have, but I certainly think that um, I think a lot of why I was able to do so, or at least offer some of our relationship from that perspective. Because of course our relationship lasted 19 years. So there was so much mm. more than what's in the book. Mm. I tried to pull the, the things that I think led to where we ended up. Um, mm. But I also have the blessing that he and I have done a lot of work together, even post-divorce. So mm. both of us, um, even though our marriage ended and for all the you know reasons it did and all them being right for both of us um we worked really hard at maintaining being a family somehow for our son and um staying friends yeah. and even through our new relationships and through difficult really difficult patches that we had you know we worked really hard at maintaining a friendship and we still have i mean i just spent the part of the day with him yesterday and um, talking about the book, actually. And, and um, I think that that helped me because if we had ended and it was sour and I had a lot of old stuff still lingering about the relationship, it might have been I might have been less apt to write about our relationship when it was good or when we went through you know, other periods where there wasn't tension. Because I still know that person, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And what what do you mean specifically by living living in the layers? Living in the layers. So so first off, I the, here's another thing. I'm not sure when you got the um, the book that was sent to you, but the the um, subtitle has since been changed to just a memoir. So we we ah. took that out. But living in the layers has been a theme for me for so long. Um, it was ignited or kind of came to me through one of my grandfather's poems. So my grandfather was, you know, a well-known poet, Stanley Kunitz. And one of his um, poems that he wrote much later in life, I think he was in, eight, he was 80 or close to 80 when he wrote the poem is called The Layers. And one of the lines in the poem is live in the layers, not on the litter. And, um, and what does litter mean? Because I think it means something different to me over here in England. <laughs> absolutely. Well, I think that it means something different to each person who's reading it and during the time in their life when they're reading it. But I think when it struck me personally, it meant live in what's real and true and deep and under the story. So climb beneath the litter, like the 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 rubbish that wants to be Oh, it is the rubbish. Yeah. So it does mean rubbish. Listen. Yeah. Too. So it's like live under what you just see on the surface. Live under what your mind wants to. The detritus, the the, the bits and bobs yes. that are floating around on the top. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. And go I into it. it. And and you know, one of the things you know for my for me and my life experience, one of the things that my grandfather almost always said to me when I first saw him, when I was, and this started when I was a kid, and I think it really impacted um, my capacity to feel myself as well as connect with others in relationship is um, he would say, how is your heart today, my dear? So not how are you or how is school 
or, you know, how, how do you feel? It was, how is your heart today? So he didn't care about the storyline in a way. You know, he didn't want me to talk about, you know, oh, this, this girl in school or this or that. He wanted to know really what was going on inside me. And I think as at being asked that starting from a young age throughout, I was blessed enough to have him alive until I was in my 30s, mid-30s. So to have someone ask you that over and over again makes you go under the litter or beneath the litter and into the layers of just like, how do I, how is my heart? Oh, my heart hurts mm. a little today. Or my mm. heart feels really like uplifted today. Or, you know, really like, how do I feel on the inside? And for me, that was so important because I always felt this, this um, division between what I was feeling on the inside and what I was receiving from the world on the outside, it never seemed, it, it took a, many, many years for those two to align, like mm -hmm. that my life reflected how I felt on the inside. I'm just mm -hmm. getting there, I think, now that I'm in my 50s, right? I think a lot of life, we're live, we feel a certain way on the inside, and how we're living doesn't necessarily meet and match that. Right. I think that's one of the joys of midlife. Yes. That's what I'm always talking about. Yeah, yeah. It's just like, we're coming into our own now. We're totally. just getting started. Like, we don't even <laughs> need to try to pretend anymore because we're like, what's, you know, there's no, yeah. there's just no need for it anymore. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and I think that that's the layers that's living in the layers, just really, you know, going, who am I? Where am I? What am I doing? How do I feel? And am I reflecting that in my day to day stuff? And changing tack slightly, Martha's Vineyard is like a character in your book um, and you live on Martha's Vineyard. And I've been to Cape Cod, but I didn't get as far as Martha's Vineyard. So what's it like living on Martha's Vineyard? And did living there enable the book? Because it feels to me like it did. Absolutely. Well, first off, you're going to have to come visit. So there's an open invite. <laughs> and if next time you're near the Cape, please let me know. And I'd love to have you on the island. Um, it is a really special place and it is like character to me. I truly mm -hmm. feel that there, I've been here for 21 years and there, first off, as I wrote in the book, I do feel like it's a calling. I feel like somehow if Martha's Vineyard wants you here, she drags you here. <laughs> There'll be something. And I mean, the first few times you come, you think you're just coming to visit, but then all of a sudden you get, you get hooked by her. And um, I do feel her as a her, right? This island. Mm. It's very. Well, her name's Martha. Yeah, of course exactly. she's a her. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's a very special place. It's, um, you know, I think like most things that we fall in love with, what makes us fall in love with it is also what's most challenging about it later on, yeah. right? Um, it's, uh, you know, there's a very strong community here. People really rally around one another, particularly in challenging times. And it's interesting because, you know, we have a very small year round community. It's growing since the pandemic for sure. But then we have this summer community that comes in. So our population, it grows 10 times the amount, if not more. So maybe in right now, I think our year round population is kind of going around 20,000. And then in the summer, you're looking at 200,000 people who are here. So it really is this like split life where mm -hmm. you have your quiet season and then you have your busy season. And both, I love both personally. I love having the quiet time. It's certainly, it's, it's in, there's an inspiration that's given here. You have oceans, you have the woods, you have beautiful nature, you have vistas. And so it's not only the community of people that really make it like a soft place to land, but the landscape and then the history, there's feels very sacred here. So um, I certainly can't imagine having written the book anywhere else but here. And I do think that it was like a gentle coaxing. Like I live in a really quiet place. There's not a lot of noise or interruption. Yeah, I mean, it's. I, I think she is a muse. The island is definitely a muse and supported, um, supports anything inspiring if if you're meant to be here yeah a great place Brilliant. to raise kids just such a beautiful place to raise kids because it really is yeah. that whole you know everybody's raising each other's kids together mm -hmm. and I have a great circle of women here that I've been friends with since I moved here you know because I teach yoga and that's what I mm -hmm. that's what I've done since I live here 
I also am around like a really beautiful community. I get to surround myself with people who are, you know, in their own self-care and healing journeys. So I think I'm extra lucky that I get that as my main source of relationships around here. Yeah. But it's a beautiful place. Definitely come visit. I want to. I really want to. Yeah. So I think I could talk to you, you know, all day, but I have to wind up. I have to wind up eventually. Perfect. And um, so I would like to ask you, what would you most like other women in this time of life to know? Mm. Well, I mean, I think the very clear message that this is the ripe time in life to try new things, trust ourselves, um, take all of the experiences that we've had and all the wisdom that we've gained from our experiences and somehow bravely share it with others. I think we, we need that. The younger generations need us. And also I think our mothers, grandmothers, great grandmothers need us as well. I believe that, you know, there's kind of like this seven generations that are healed through everything that we do. So three behind us and the three to come. And so I would just say that bold, brave, like we know at this age and there's no need to um, talk ourselves out of anything anymore, I think. To really just like trust where your heart and your soul wants to go and step into it because the world is waiting for what we have to give right now. I really do believe that. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Magnificent Midlife Podcast. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe, follow and share it. Also, giving a five-star review really helps get the word out. You'll find the show notes at magnificentmidlife.com. That's also where you can get my book, Magnificent Midlife, Transform Your Middle Years, Menopause and Beyond. Make the very best of your next chapter. Help me change the world, one magnificent midlife woman at a time.